Okay, well, welcome back, and for our video, our streaming audience, welcome to Hidden Histories of World War II, which is an educator workshop that is funded in part by the National Endowment for the Humanities, the National Park Service, the Pacific Historic Parks, Japanese Cultural Center of Hawaii, Matsunaga Institute for Peace, and Gulf of Broke National Education Center. I'm Mitch Maki, and I will be your panel moderator, uh, as well as a partial presenter in this next panel. So we are very excited <coughs> to in, uh, in welcome two of our guests here today. And I'm just going to tell you who they are, because later I'm going to uh, talk about what they're going to talk about. First of all, we have Carol Hayashino. And Carol uh, was a former vi uh, president and executive director of the Japanese Cultural Center as well as being an active member of the Japanese American Cis uh, Citizens League during the campaign for redress in the 80s. And to her left is Bill Koneko, who is a pr uh, practicing attorney here in Hawaii. But uh, the reason he is joining us here today is that he played a very influential role, a critical role, in making sure that those who were affected by the discrimination and the oppression during World War II would be included in the Civil Liberties Act of 1988. And again, I'm going to leave it at that because I'm going to build them up a little bit uh, <laughs> more as we get into it. You know, I realize that for the <coughs> teachers that are here amongst us, you may not know that I was also the lead author of a book called Achieving the Impossible Dream, How Japanese Americans Obtained Redress. So that's why I get to do this panel here today. So just to start us off, we spent the last day talking about Hono Uli Uli. We talked about what's happened here in Hawaii. And so we don't want to belabor the point for this panel that December 7th, 1941, it thrust the United States into World War II. And we know that there was incredible discrimination and a violation of constitutional rights, both here in Hawaii, but also on the continent. The war ends. Japanese Americans are released from these camps. And it would take about three decades for our community to go from a place of seeing what happened to us from being a social misfortune, that's just how it was being Japanese in America during the 40s and during World War II, to later in the 70s, really beginning to understand that it wasn't a social <coughs> misfortune, but was in fact a political injustice. It was an injustice and a constitutional violation that was perpetrated upon our community, an American community. The 70s rolls along, and our community essentially is split. There are some that say, let it go. It happened a long time ago. We're past it. And I don't want to have to remember and retell those stories. There's a second group that says, no. What we are deserving of is a good, clean apology. Just give <coughs> us a good, clean apology. And don't put a price tag on my civil liberties. You know, don't insult me. Just give me a good, clean apology. And the final group that said, you're right. We deserve an apology but we deserve monetary reparations that comes along with that. It wasn't if they just called us names and hurt our feelings. There were real losses. People lost their homes, their jobs, their businesses. Give us an apology and give us monetary reparations with that uh, apology so that it becomes an authentic apology. Eventually, a commission, the Commission on Wartime Relocation and Internment of Civilians is created, and it travels the nation hearing testimony of those who were involved in the <coughs> camps. Then fast forward to find, well, and, and the, the commission issues its findings in 1982, saying that the camps were wrong and that the camps were the result of race prejudice, wartime hysteria, and a failure of political leadership. Very powerful words to aim at the um, Roosevelt <coughs> administration. Race prejudice, wartime hysteria, and a failure of political leadership. The bill then goes to the Congress, and it takes five years of lobbying and fighting in the halls of Congress until finally on September 17, 1987, it passes the House. This impossible dream that Japanese Americans would get an acknowledgment and, and an apology passes the House of Representatives with 243 votes. <coughs> 
180 of them Democrats, 63 of them Republican. <laughs> Truly a bipartisan effort. Seven months later, it hits the Senate, and we knew it would pass the Senate because Senator Matsunaga, who we've talked about many times over the last couple of days, had individually lobbied every other senator, and by the time it hit the floor of the Senate, we had 71 co-sponsors. So Senator Matsunaga locked it up for us in the Senate. So now we need just one more supporter, one more signature. And as we learned the other day, that was the President of the United States, President Ronald Reagan. Right? And for those of you who remember Reagan, whether you agreed with his policies or not, most people would agree that he was a great communicator, that he could tell stories that would move people in a certain direction. But the opposite was true. If you could tell him a story that would touch his heart, you could have a great advocate on your hands. So the question became, what story could we tell Ronald Reagan? Two brownie points. What was the story we told Ronald Reagan? The story about the Nisei soldier, Kazuo Masuda. And just to refresh your memory, Kazuo Masuda was a, a Nisei veteran, and he was asked, why are you doing this? Why are you fighting for America while they have your own family in a concentration camp? And his answer was, because this is the only way that I know that my family can have a chance in America. Right or wrong, agree with him or not, the Nisei soldiers, <coughs> and Kazuo Masuda in particular, understood that in 1943, 1944, 1945, loyalty needed to be demonstrated in blood. And as we remember, two weeks after saying that, Kazuo Masuda is killed in battle, fighting for his nation. His family is released from the camps after the war, only to be met with hate speech, racial uh, taunts, and threats of bodily harm. And the army sends out a contingent of army officers to have a medal ceremony for the Masuda family. And on that day, at a convention um, dinner, there was a young white American captain who addressed the audience. And he said, the blood that is soaked into the sands of a beach is all of one color. America stands unique in the world, the only nation not founded on race, <coughs> but on an ideal. Mr. and Mrs. Masuda is one member of the American family to another for what your son Kazuo did. Thanks. And that young white American captain was Ronald Reagan. That story was relayed to President Reagan four decades later. And his response was, I remember what those soldiers did for America. And it aligned his personal and his political values with the story that we've been talking about. Now, here's the surprise for you all today. Guess who found that story? Carol Hayashima. As a, as a young staffer with the JCL, she knew she had to find a story that would make it personal to Ronald Reagan. And you can tell more details later. But she is the one that found <coughs> that story. And we were able to pass it on to the president. So on August 10, 1988, President Reagan signs the Civil Liberties Act, giving an apology and monetary reparations to those who had suffered the discrimination and the constitutional violations of World War II. Now, for many people, they think that this is a story that affects mostly the Japanese Americans on the continent. But as we learned through Honolulu Uli and through uh, several of our other discussions, there were Americans of Japanese ancestry here in Hawaii that were equally, uh, equally had their constitutional rights violated. And that's where Bill comes in, where when he and the Honolulu JCL understood <coughs> what was happening and understood that these individuals in Hawaii were not initially included in the legislation or in the interpretation of the uh, uh, legislation, they went to work. And they said, we're not going to let them be left out. And that's what we're going to talk about here. So it's my pleasure to have both of you here today and we're going to start off because Bill has been very active in putting together a documentary about this <coughs> whole story. And he's going to share with us the trailer of his documentary because he wants you to come and see the real deal <laughs> once it's released. So with that, let me turn it over to Bill. I thought you were going to show the trailer. Okay, well, you yeah. want to say a few words about the trailer? Yeah, um, thanks, Mitch, and 
How good to be on the panel with you. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Bill Kaneko. Um, I just so happen to be the um, Honolulu chapter president uh, when all these redress cases uh, broke uh, in, in the 80s. And we actually are finishing up a documentary on the uh, what we call the unlawful eviction as opposed to the incarceration of Japanese in Hawaii. So what you're going to be seeing is a trailer that kind of tees up the general um, um, events of what happened, and then I'll get into more in detail of how we went about getting redressed. So, all right, let's roll it. Thank you. 
So I guess, you know, during the past few days, you've learned about <coughs> the internment nationally and then here in Hawaii, and that, you know, the classic story, of course, is <coughs> the 2,000 who were interned here, primarily in Hanauli Uli and Sand Island. I mean, that has been written about uh, at length, and there's uh, a lot of uh, documentation and books and documentaries about that. Um, what <coughs> we're going to be talking about this afternoon and really the, the heart of the documentary is the 1,500 uh, persons who are not interned or incarcerated but evicted from their homes. And um, when this all happened, I think some 30 years ago, um, the redress bill had passed in uh, 1988. And at that time, the Department of Justice, um, like they did throughout the country, has started traveling all over the United States, uh, getting in touch with the Japanese American community on how to go about um, applying for and getting redress. So Robert Bratt, who is the administrator of redress, um, was going all over the United States, uh, primarily in the West Coast, uh, meeting with community leaders all over the, the country. Uh, he came to Hawaii um, because of the um, incarceration here and held workshops. And there was a lot of publicity around that um, because he was holding these large town halls and uh, because there are 2,000 persons uh, incarcerated, it generated a lot of interest uh, but a lot of press. And so when the JACL started working with the Department of Justice, uh, the media in, uh, in publicizing this, was, it was you know, pretty significant because of the large Japanese American community here. Uh, we started getting calls from persons who were not interned but evicted. And that's when this whole story began. Uh, I remember, um, when I, the chapter president, it's all volunteer organization. So the, the office, the JACL office was wherever the, the president lived. But um, I came home one day and I, I probably had about 50 or 60 calls uh, on my answering machine asking, you know, I wasn't interned, uh, but I was kicked out of my home. Um, and this occurred in places like Lua Lua Lei or Waiau. Paoa Valley, Ivale, Haiku. I mean, the, the calls just started to come in. And we were actually <clears throat> somewhat dumbfounded because that, uh, the stories of the evictions um, uh, was the first time really that not only the local community, uh, but the Department of Justice had heard about this. And so um, we went back and looked at the, the record of the Commission on Wartime Relocation to see whether or not this was even documented during the hearings, and the answer was no. And so, uh, and Carol, and mm -hmm. please feel I just kind of chime in because <laughs> we want this to be a, a discussion. Um, but so we were really unclear as to how to handle these, these um, these new cases. So I went to um, our legal counsel and asked for a, an opinion as to whether or not he thought that the eviction cases uh, were covered under the Civil Liberties Act because the act itself was primarily for a uh, person's intern. And to his credit, uh, and, and because of Clayton E.K., who was uh, counsel at the time, he read the act as very expansive. Uh, because he felt that um, they were evicted, uh, displaced from their homes at gunpoint because of a, a military order, that they were in fact deprived of their civil liberties. And that was very, very crucial. So we started um, going out and doing workshops in the community and like hundreds of people showed up right here. Um, at the, uh, at the <coughs> this was actually before the center was built, mm -hmm. it was at the uh, Honolulu Japanese Chamber of Commerce uh, auditoriums, and you know, we had like four or 500 people show up at, at any given weekend. Uh, again, persons who are not uh, interned but evicted, so we're like, 
holy smokes, like what is what is going on here? If I can jump in too, yeah. Bill, because the challenge also was that there weren't cookie cutter cases because each of these cases were a little bit different. Sometimes people were evacuated, and that's the proper term for military necessity. Whole communities would be evacuated, but only the non-Japanese Americans would be allowed back into the area. Other times, Japanese American families were uh, made to move from their homes and, and never allowed to come back. And, and in fact, I've told this to Bill, my mother-in-law was one of those individuals. She, uh, as a young girl, was living with her family in Waiau, which is right by Pearl Harbor. They and their whole community, everyone had to move out. But my mother-in-law's family and the other Japanese American families were not allowed to move in. So she actually benefited from your work. Yeah. Right. So I would just want to chime in, you know, from at that time, while the redress, when the redress bill was passed, signed into law, um, and uh, working with, uh, you know, Department of Justice is beginning its process to identify qualified recipients. Um, I was in San Francisco at the JCL National Headquarters. And so I'm working at the national level. And I we get word from the Honolulu JCL, from Bill Kaneko, about this these really, this unique case of people who were not incarcerated, they were not picked up, but they were evicted from their home. And you know, at the time, I remember that we suspected the U.S. Department of Census would track the Japanese household residents in a community. And we suspected at that time that that information was shared with the government officials. And I'm, I think that has been proven true now mm -hmm. that, um, the government knew where every person, every Japanese household was, so it was very easy for them to begin to discriminate and just remove the persons of Japanese, the Japanese household, and not allow them to return. And that's what happened. Yeah, in fact, there was, and I think Tom Kaufman uh, writes about this in the, in his book. But there were, to Carol's point already identified pockets mm -hmm. of Japanese Americans, um, and they knew where they were living uh, in relation to, um, you know, living around military sensitive installations, and that's exactly what happened. So um, <coughs> the eviction actually happened uh, formally, really, in 23 geographic areas. So Japanese uh, Americans who are living near Pearl Harbor, or the Kahuku Airfield, Lua Lua Lei Ammunition Depot. I mean, these were very targeted communities. And so right after the war, after the war um, military came in at gunpoint and just literally displaced them, kicked them out of their homes. And the quandary, I think, for not only the JACL um, and the Department of Justice was like, well, how do you prove that? Mm -hmm. And the, the, the distinction between the eviction cases and the internment cases was that there were no lists. So if you were interned mm -hmm. at Manzanar or Honouli Uli or Sand Island, there was actually a, a camp roster. Um, we had 1,500 Japanese Americans who were just displaced. There was no roster. Uh, there was no proof, actually, that they actually lived there uh, and that were, they were displaced. So the evolution of these legal cases was, you know, very, very uh, confusing uh, for the Department of Justice on, in terms of how do you go about uh, really taking a, a, a very accurate uh, view and then rendering a decision. Um, so it's very, very, uh, uh, very convoluted and messy process. So tell us, how do you how do, do it? You do it? <laughs> <laughs> Good question. <laughs> Good moderator. <laughs> <coughs> so uh, long story short, um, the Department of Justice actually created what's called the Special Veri Verification Unit, SVU. And those were the so-called unique cases where the department really had to allocate resources to uh, uh, these non-cookie cutter uh, cases like the Hawaii cases. Um, so what the JSL did was we started doing our, uh, in our own research. 
And um, it's in the documentary. You should come. <laughs> uh, but one of the stars <coughs> of this whole story is a young uh, researcher named Tam Funai. And Tam Funai was a graduate student at the University of Hawaii at the time, you know, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. And she called uh, the JACL one day and said, I want to do research on Hanauli Uli and Sand Island. Like, okay, well, go at it. But I think I've got a better project, not a better project <laughs> for you. i got a really cool project for you. <clears throat> Can you help us uh, research the uh, eviction cases? And she said, sure. So she went down to the Hamilton Library. There's a war, World War II section uh, in the basement of the library. She probably must have been there like a month or so. And she ran across uh, military documents, uh, pretty much, not pretty much, ordering Japanese Americans in uh, certain areas like Waiau and Ivalay that if you're Japanese, you were going to be displaced. So that's when it really all started. I mean, there was written orders and proof and evidence that the, that the United States government did target uh, Japanese Americans based on their ancestry. And this is like when it all happened. So we went back to the Department of Justice and said, look it, this is what we found. And then the DOJ actually uh, allocated more resources and started doing research, not only in Hawaii, but throughout the country. So, Bill, if I can add a little bit to that story, because I wrote about that in, in my books. And Pam is a personal friend of mine, and she was tasked with finding that documentation, and she said it was like looking for a needle in a haystack. However, while searching through the documents in Hamilton Library at the University of Hawaii, Funai found a letter from the office of the Assistant Provost Marshal in Honolulu that stated, quote, pursuant to the provisions of the directive issued by the commanding general, the Hawaiian Department dated January 7, 1943, all alien Japanese and citizens of Japanese ancestry residing in the areas hereby designated will be evacuated. This order is issued in the interest of public safety. And then I made the commentary. Upon making her discovery, Funai, in her true Hawaiian pidgin English, yelled, score. <laughs> <laughs> and the librarian came over to her and told her, shh. But that's what opened up the door for you to do the work that you're doing. Right, yeah. So, uh, you know, we had th the military order, uh, which was essential. Uh, then the other question was, how do you prove that um, really that you resided there? So the government required uh, two affidavits, sworn statements uh, by yourself and then a third party. Um, then it gets really complicated uh, because in many of the areas, everyone was displaced, all persons. In addition to Japanese Americans, you know, Native Hawaiians, Chinese Americans, and so what was the distinction? And so we ran into a lot of legal hurdles because the Department of Justice, they can't just hand out checks. I mean, they have to do their job. And denied uh, the Japanese Americans uh, because they said that everybody was displaced, which is a fact. The differentiator, though, is that um, for the non-Japanese, uh, later in time, they could come back to their homes. Um, so they had the opportunity to go back in, and live in their, in, their, in their homes after they were displaced. Uh, in other cases, um, the evacuation of the non-Japanese happened in a more planned and orderly fashion. It happened several months after they kicked out the Japanese. Uh, Americans, and they were offered other places to, to live. Uh, they were, you know, they gave them due notice uh, in terms of that, that they needed to evacuate uh, around their homes. So they were treated very, very differently. And it was the Japanese Americans who were displaced on the spot, uh, really no uh, warning whatsoever uh, because of their ancestry. And that was the, the distinction. But 
All in all, as I had mentioned, I mean, this happened in, in uh, 23 geographic locations. I mean, a lot of, uh, even till today, a lot of people uh, don't know about this, uh, uh, what happened, and that's really the, the, the story and the subject matter of, of the documentary. So, Bill, how did, how did it get approved? Because um, it wasn't necessarily necessary <coughs> to introduce new legislation. It was just important that the Office of Redress Administration say, yes, this falls under the purview of the Civil Liberties Act. So how did that come about, and how, what was the first case in your, that you remember saying, yes, this is approved? Yeah, I mean, the first uh, couple cases were um, Lua Lua Lay and Potwell Valley. I mean, those are kind of like, I don't want to say no-brainers, but I mean, in those instances, like, only Japanese Americans were displaced. So those... Um, Cases were awarded now uh, with the military order in hand, only Japanese Americans, I think the Department of Justice was able to render a decision quickly. It, it was like the other 21 cases that took literally years uh, because uh, each and every geographic location, the circumstances were very different. Uh, what we had to do is, you know, we worked with pro bono lawyers uh, of the Japanese American Citizens League, uh, the National Asian Pacific American Bar Association, NAPABA, which is also a social justice organization, all provided free legal work, but um, uh, it took, you know, thousands of hours of, 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 you know, dealing with the Department of Justice. And to answer Mitch's question, I mean, we took the act, and again, it was broad enough uh, under the provision that they're deprived of their civil liberties based on their Japanese ancestry, which was the legal language that was needed for the department to ultimately grant regis. Now, having said that, Robert Bratt, who was the administrator at that time, he had a lot of internal battle uh, that he shared. Uh, he shares uh, shared during that time um, because he would be here in Hawaii listening to stories of hundreds of people saying, you know, I was kicked out and I had no warning and it was by military force. And then he goes back <laughs> up to Washington and has to deal with his lawyers saying like, why are you doing this? You know, this is, it should be clean cut. It's just, you know, dealing with the incarceration. And so, um, again, it took several years to ultimately resolve these cases, but un in the end, uh, we were able to get about 1,500 persons redress, and uh, at $20,000 each, you're talking about $30 million. So there was a pretty significant economic impact as well. So I this think is I want to add something, though. Oh, well, let me, let me okay. say something about you first, because no. I'm not going to say no. this about yourself. Uh, so this is all happening in the early 1990s. Carol, you're still in... I'm a young child. Y yeah. You're still, yeah, you're 10 years old at that point, <laughs> and you're, you're still in California. You're right. still looking at this from a national perspective. But just a side story, 20 years later, Carol comes to Honolulu. She was the president and executive director here at JCCH, and we all spent time at Honolulu Uli yesterday. She was a driving force in bringing attention to Honolulu Uli, to making it, uh, to putting it on the National Park Service map and so forth. So what we were able to do yesterday is in large part uh, thanks to the efforts of uh, many people, but one many of which people, was, yeah. was Carol. But so my question to you is, you're in uh, hmm. uh, California, still seeing redress <coughs> as a national issue, right? And you hear about this happening in Hawaii. What was your reaction and perspective? Well, Really, we had gone through extensive research, right? With the commission ha had its own did its own research. We had the public hearings, and we had not heard of any of these new stories that emerged after the passage of the bill. I think that's number one. Like what? I think we we're all just baffled and shocked and surprised. Um, but what I wanted to say before uh, Mitch interrupted me <laughs> was. Um, <laughs> Was that, you know, when Bill talks about the redress cases and, and uh, obtaining redress for this special class of people, um, it's very much like the national effort for redress. They, people, they, they were volunteers. And many of us were young, were fairly young. And 
And there was, this had never been done before. Redress, uh, having the government apologize for a 30, 40 year old um, injustice and providing monetary compensation. You know, that it had never been, it had never happened. And there was no playbook. There was, and we just, and Bill and the team of attorneys here just became, you know, they just became activists. And they became they they led the way for uh, for um, for reparations for this class of people, and I think that's really remarkable because we're not trained, you know, we don't learn about social justice, or we don't learn how to organize or community organizing, or um, but but I would hope that the lessons of redress is one of encouraging and inspiring young people to get involved to become engaged and tr and make a difference because sometimes the difference, the work that you do as a volunteer does make a lasting impression um, for the community. And I think that's the, uh, what happened with the Honolulu JCL and Bill and many of the local attorneys who volunteered. I mean, that's what they did. They made a lasting impression. They changed, they changed and contributed to history. I think to, <clears throat> to follow up on Carol's point, I think when this all hit, I was chapter president, and I think I was 30 years old at the time. Um, I'm 40 now, by the way. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, it was very young, uh, and the lawyer, pro bono lawyers that we had were probably in their early or mid-30s. And the interesting part of it is that, and the lawyers that were helping us were transactional lawyers. They were business lawyers. They weren't civil rights lawyers. Uh, they weren't even litigators. So, but they did this, you know, because they felt strongly about it. But, you know, because they're trans transition transactional lawyers doesn't mean they could weren't, you know, able to duly represent the JCL. They're super smart. Came from the best law schools, uh, but they translated those skills. But we had these like young uh, associates in, in law firms throughout the state going against like the top litigators and appellate lawyers in the country at the Department of Justice. I mean, it, in terms of experience, it was so uneven. But everyone, you know, put all their best efforts and used their skills as, you know, 30-something and, uh, and really uh, prevailed. And I think that in part is you know, part of the story here is that you don't have to be trained in a certain way, but if you have drive and perseverance and, um, you know, um, at least some common sense that you can do really great things, and that's, I think, part of the story here uh, in terms of the eviction cases. Any questions or any questions from our audience, our streaming audience at this point? So I, I think for me, you know, it, this is not just a story of what happened during World War II and then the fight for justice, but I'm thinking as you work with your students, it's a great case study of how activism can, can address the wrongs of the past. You know, and, and if we think about all the communities that are represented here, you know, and all the wrongs that have been done in our nation, what are some of the things you, your students might get excited about in terms of thinking, wow, you know, maybe maybe we can address some of the injustices of the past. Anybody have ideas of how you might use that? Uh, Belinda in the back and then Sean. I think one thing that I've tried to cover, especially like when I've done civil rights movements, is like the role of young people in organizing. And I think that this is an easy um, tie into that and that it sometimes change doesn't necessarily come from people who are the, the grown-ups or the adults, you know, and sometimes it is the children or the grandchildren who are the ones that are taking on that responsibility to try to push it. And can I also add that it would make an excellent movie. Like, I'm, like, I'm listening to you guys talk, and it would sound like <laughs> an awesome movie to see these, these young lawyers in action taking on the government. <laughs> 
No, we, <laughs> that's the movie. That's the movie. <laughs> that's the movie. <laughs> that's a documentary that yeah. they're putting together. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But in fact, you know, Belinda, I would even say that change oftentimes comes from the young and not the establishment, you know, and so forth. And and uh, Bill, you and I have had this conversation that, you know, the fact that you were 30, the fact that you were just starting your career, and you know, you didn't have a fully developed law practice making the you know the salary of a 60 or 70 year old attorney in some ways that liberated you to to devote the time and energy to this and so it's not surprising to me that you had a cadre of young attorneys you know who were idealistic and also had the freedom to do this yeah right yeah and i think you know to your point i mean there's a lot of power in youth uh, and that should be harnessed and taken advantage of. And, you know, as you get older, you become a lot more conservative, you have things to lose. But now having said that, it's an incredible training ground for young people to engage in uh, social justice and just community service. I mean, you know, for the young lawyers, I mean, to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the, the, the appellate division of the Department of Justice, I mean, during these cases, um, Representing, uh, you know, the JACL, I engaged with senior officials at the Department of Justice. Um, Deval Patrick was one of the leads at that time. Deval Patrick was the Assistant Attorney General of Civil Rights. I'm just like 30-year-old kid, you know, sitting in his office and, you know, on Constitutional Avenue. And like, how often do you have that opportunity? Mm -hmm. And so if you look at, and I'm super bullish on community service, if you look at the folks who took leadership roles uh, during this time and you know other initiatives from the JACL and where they are now, I mean, they've, they're judges, they're CEOs, they're partners at law firms. Is because I think the training that you get engaging in uh, community service and activism, you're not gonna get that sitting in your office or doing things, even like teaching in a classroom, and there's certain skills that you really gain uh, when you're out there in the community, and in the long run, that not only benefits you, but it benefits society, and I think that's one of the key messages here. And throughout the redress movement, there were not only young attorneys, but high school students, college students, passing out petitions and being involved, and, and as Bill said, it was a tremendous training ground. Sean, you had a question. Yeah, <clears throat> um, first I would say uh, I think that I'm going to definitely try to incorporate this into our uh, Model UN. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, I think it's a good um, where they can see um, basically how change can happen, uh, especially over time. Uh, I teach at Waipahu High School, and I think another thing I'd like to address um, is that we get a lot of, uh, we have a large mi Micronesian population, and I think uh, a success story like this could help motivate uh, because a lot of the wrongs like Bikini Atoll uh, were never uh, uh, basically, no, the wrongs were never righted. And I think that like a success story like this, um, you know, could be used. Uh, and I, I'll get with you guys afterwards for maybe some resources that could kind of like lead me down that road to uh, kind of maybe help build a, um, maybe a lesson or something just so that way I can kind of, because that's, you know, a, hu a huge population that's often misunderstood, especially at our school, um, and the same, they, they never got a lot of the, the uh, compensation or uh, even the acknowledgement of the wrongs that, that happened to, to their uh, population. Mitch hinted in, in, the, uh, in his introduction today how the community was split, divided on on seeking redress, reparations from the from the government. One, there was a strong, strong segment of the Japanese community that didn't want to pursue it. And then there was a small segment that said we should at least, they should at least apologize. And there was another small segment that said, that pushed for the apology and monetary compensation. So that, I mean, there was a lot of internal education to do within the community. At the same time, there was the broader education that needed to be done with members of Congress and the general public. In the 1980s, every newspaper on the West Coast had supported the incarceration, a mass removal of and incarceration of Americans of Japanese ancestry from the West Coast. Many people, the general public, still believe that 
Americans of Japanese ancestry were involved in the bombing of Pearl Harbor. And when we began making, lobbying the US Congress in 1980 to establish the Co Commission on Wartime Relocation and Internment of Civilians, that was the response from many members of Congress. And, and, and there was, the issue was completely misunderstood. So it began with education. It began with that discussion with the public and within the community that it was okay to pursue. And one thing I learned from the early days was, you know, history must be told by those who lived it. So the, the Japanese American survivors, the survivors of the incarceration needed to step forward and tell their stories. And through the commission process, they finally did. But it begins a first step. I think, you know, I'm, I'm, I um, totally support what you're, what you're, where you're going and what you want to do. It begins with that kind of education. Speaking of how to impart this knowledge with our younger generations, I was just thinking about uh, the whole uh, infringement upon our civil liberties through the COVID thing that we all came out of. And obviously for all of us, it's real. We lived it. And for my young students who are fifth graders now who had to do distance learning a whole year of that, I think they can f draw parallels between how their civil liberties were infringed upon as, as older generations were, such as my dad. Yeah, I think the role that all of you play are, are crucial in terms of bringing up these kinds of issues. Um, <clears throat> you know, I'm born and raised here, and um, went, away, went all the way up to high school and really didn't even know about the internment until I took a course from uh, Franklin Odo who was a professor at the UH Ethnic Studies program. And I was just like, eyes wide open, floored. And, you know, through uh, ethnic studies, we not only had uh, read about the internment, but other social injustices. Uh, but Franklin took a very proactive approach. He had us go to Chinatown, and we talked about the Chinatown evictions, or Waihole Waikane, you know, the, the struggles here in Hawaii. And that's when, like, things became, like, really real but if you don't have those you know learning opportunities for young kids um they'll not learn about it so you know things that mitch and nate are doing today are, are very very important uh to be able to maintain you know not only that awareness but ensure that you know all persons are treated equally it's an important uh you know component of the you know of democracy for not only hawaii but for our country so mm -hmm. you know i hope that you will you know, take what you learned over the weekend or for the last couple of days and, and impart that on your students. Bill, I mean, obviously this is such an impressive story and this question is going to sound simplistic, but what does it mean to you to have been involved in this and to uh, see it be successful? But what does it mean to Bill Koneko? <laughs> well, like I said, I think um, for myself, um, the, it's always usually about like I can can I do something for the community? I mean, but in in many respects, I mean, I was also a beneficiary as well. So like I said, I mean, engaging in community service um, and doing things outside your uh, you know your normal work is really the, that what I got out of it. It was really a gift to me as well um, to be able to do things and to to learn skills that you're not doing uh in your normal course and you know running a, a quote a chapter of the jacl i mean oh that seems kind of mundane but when you think about it you know you're you have to um, run a non-profit corporation you have to file articles and make sure that your filings are um you know in accordance with state law you have to run meetings i mean they don't teach you that like doing something, uh, if you're a teacher in a classroom or being a young lawyer, I mean that, but it, it stretches your skill set and it gives you all these unique opportunities to be able to expand, expand your horizon. So, I mean, I think folks like you and Carol and, uh, you know, all those who engage in, in activism, I think that's the gift to, to ourselves. Yeah. Carol, how about you? you? You played a big role in the national level and – 
What does this all mean to you? Okay, I'll just start by telling my story. Please, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm a sansei, third generation Japanese American. I'm a native Californian. My parents, my grandparents, my aunts and uncles were all incarcerated during, 19, uh, during World War II. As a child, I grew up hearing the stories, hearing my father's stories about being, about my grandfather being picked up by the FBI, sent off to a county jail, and then to a Department of Justice camp in Santa Fe, New Mexico. The family remained in Stockton. My father was the oldest of four children. He was um, his first year of college. Um, they were forced to pack up and move from Stockton, put on a, sent to um, horse stalls in a county fairground before they were sent away to the more permanent concentration camp in um, Arkansas. So I grew up hearing the stories of my father and my grandparents um, as a child. And um, when I was in the fifth grade as a 10-year-old kid, I uh, gave my first oral history report, a family history, to my class. And I told the story about my father's incarceration as a kid. And I remember, and this of course is many, many years ago, um, and I remember very clearly, and there were three other Japanese American kids in the class, um, the teacher turned and asked the class, did this happen to any of you, any of your parents? And nobody, no one raised their hand. And I thought, oh my gosh, this only happened to my family. So what, you know, what, what did they do that they would be sent, picked up and sent to jail or sent to a prison camp in Arkansas? What happened? What did they do wrong? So as a child, that motivated me actually to learn more about my own family history, um, which I did. And so years later, of course, during the 60s and 70s, um, civil rights movement, the establishment of ethnic studies on college campuses, of course, I began to then understand the impact upon the community and what had happened to my family had happened to so many people and so many, and the majority of the Issei and Nisei, the Japanese, the generations who were, um, were affected, um, it was just too painful of an experience to discuss amongst their own family. So when I had the opportunity to work um, at the JACL, I accepted it with because I was then, at that point, very committed to documenting, preserving, sharing the stories of, Japanese Amer of the Japanese Americans who were incarcerated. And I still felt, feel that today. Um, it was for me, to, uh, working on redress on the national, with the National Committee for Redress, um, I started, I was a 27-year-old kid, you know, working with this national committee on, on national legislation. Um, and I started with the personal motivation about my family, motivated by my family, seeking justice for my family. And then I realized it's about the community. And, now, and then I began to realize it's not just the, a Japanese American issue. The incarceration and redress for Japanese Americans was not just a Japanese American issue. It was a, it's, a, it's an American issue. It's an, it, it's an it's a shared history of our nation. And redress for Japanese Americans really goes to the heart of the Constitution, as Bill said. It's about equal protection, due process under the law that's promised to U.S. citizens. And that's where our Constitution failed. So there were so many lessons. I mean, there are those lessons of the Constitution. But for me personally, you know, I started working on redress because um, because of my family. And when I, in 1980, when I first began, my grandparents were living, my aunts and uncles, my mother and father um, were living. But at the point that President Reagan signed the bill in 1988, only my grandmother and my mother were living. So, and it became, I was happy for them that finally they saw they were vindicated 
And I was, and I, at the same time, I was very sad that my, the rest of my family and so many other um, people who were affected did not receive that apology or the acknowledgement that what they had gone through was wrong. So I had really mixed emotions, but I will also say that what I learned during the 1980s um, working on the redress on redress really helped me when I came to Hawaii and to, uh, and help and work to preserve Hona Uli Uli because I understood what can be done, what we can do when you organize, develop allies, work in coalitions, work with other people good things can happen. And because of the work of JCCH, the com com very committed volunteers uh, of the organization and so many members and so many supporters, um, President Obama signed, as you know, um, Hona Uli Uli, recognized Hona Uli Uli as a National Historic Monument. Time is upon us, and I, I hope you've enjoyed this panel discussion as much as I've enjoyed it. And I'll just say that as I listen to Bill and Carol, I don't think this is a history lesson. I think this is a lesson in civic engagement. It's a lesson that you all can take back to your classrooms and figure out how do you inspire your young people to be engaged, to make a difference, to address the concerns of their communities, of our communities. So thank you, Bill, for the work that you've done in the past, but thank you for being here today. Carol, same to you. You know how I feel about you. Thank you for the work you've done in the past, and but thank you for being here and sharing. And, and Mitch is such a wonderful storyteller. He's just so good. I'm so. such a wonderful storyteller. My mother used to always say, you're such a good storyteller. Now tell me what really happened. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But thank you all for being here with us today, and uh, hopefully Bill and Carol can stick around for a few minutes if you have any thoughts or questions you want to raise. Uh, Nani? Well, you know, okay, part, I had a lot of different jobs when I worked at the, at JACL. I was like national coordinator for redress. I was public information officer. Um, but early on, uh, once the commission was established, we needed to, um, we need, I needed to, we needed to write testimony um, for, co to Congress and to the commission. So I was, I was um, tasked with, with all the historic research. So I actually traveled to Roosevelt Library in Poughkeepsie. I went to uh, Cincinnati, went, uh, reviewed the, the, the files of uh, historian Roger Daniels, who was like the premier historian on the subject. And I also went to um, Hoover Institute at Stanford to look at Ronald Reagan's papers. So I, I and I went to UC uh, Berkeley Bancroft Library and went through all the death certificates and birth certificates uh, at each camp. They had hard copies. So I, I mean, I did extensive, I had the opportunity to do a lot of extensive research. But it was at Hoover Institute at Stanford, I was looking, some, looking for something specific for Ronald Reagan, and I came across this newspaper article that reported, that report, that reported the Ronald Reagan's um, remarks which actually happened, I think, at Hollywood Bowl or something, right? Mm -hmm. And um, and I, so yeah, so that's how I found it. And I grabbed it, and I knew that this would be what would touch his heart. It's one thing to argue the legal, but you need to touch his heart. And I knew that would do it. And um, I shared that with the national president. And actually, the national president shared it with the Reagan um, staff with the President Reagan's staff. And the, the inside scoop is that Reagan, Reagan's staff did not want him, that did not want the President to support redress. They, were, they knew that if he saw the article, that it would touch him, it would, it would sway him. So they tried to keep this redress story away from him as long as they could. But eventually it got, it, got to his attention, it got to his desk, uh, other people brought it up to him. But that's the story. Bill and Carol, thank you very much.
And uh, if you can stay around for a few minutes, I'm sure people will have questions. So thank you.